It's fun to have Sherry and the gang up here. Uh, the church started 10 years ago in June, 10 years ago this month. Yes? And I look around and most of you look 10 years older. <laughs> Man, it's just hard to believe 10 years it's flown by. You know, Red's sitting out here and he said, when you turn 50, time will fly. And I thought, what's the difference? It flies. We're in the middle of summer already. So when Sherry started 10 years ago with us, there was one up there, Sherry, by herself. It's neat to see how God's blessed it and grown. And they're going to be at the uh, fair at the East Area Water Tail County Fair helping out, so it's going to be an awesome day. So if you can make it there that morning, be yeah. glad to have you come down. It'll be fun. It's nice to see so many people here. Somebody probably put out the rumor I wasn't speaking tonight. <laughs> Too bad. In a little over a week, it's going to be 4th of July. Who likes 4th of July? Huh? The picnics and whatnot. Who loves fireworks? Like me? Like crazy? Yes. I, I love fireworks. I've uh, never been able to have a lot of them, but they cost a lot of money, but they're a lot of fun. But I was thinking back to when I was a kid, and of course, back in those days, they, they were illegal in Minnesota, and so it was quite something when my dad got some fireworks from where my mom worked, it came from North Dakota. It was kind of like this mafia thing to me. It's like, open up the trunk and hear some black cats and stuff like that. And, and so we would start always with the smallest thing first. We'd do the sparklers. I never liked sparklers. I think sparklers are crazy because they offer them to the kids. They're like red hot burning sticks of metal. I mean, it's like, you know, meanwhile, you got to wear a helmet for anything else, right? It's crazy. And then we had the black snakes, huh? Boy, weren't they exciting. Wow. And then now, these days in Minnesota, for some reason, we're like, not as smart as North Dakota because we can't apparently shoot stuff up in the air safely. North Dakota can shoot them like crazy, but how many of you know that law doesn't get followed, huh? I just want to let you know that Park Rapids this year, Mike's Lock and Key, who I work with in Perm, his hobby or his other job is putting together firework displays all over the nation. And so last year he did Park Rapids, but he's not this year, but he said, if you're looking in a five-state area, Park Rapids is going to have the biggest fireworks display in five states. Oh. So, yeah, ho oh, oh. Should we just stop the sermon there? I mean, let's go. Get a, let's get a spot. So anyways, if you're looking for something to do, he said it's going to be fantastic. And he was talking about they've built some shells that are 160 pounds, and they're like 20 inches around, and it's just amazing. I can't find those anywhere in the uh, stands that I go to. And then, of course, those limpy smoke bombs, right? Yeah, so anyways, I, as a kid, I, uh, I like fireworks. The title of the sermon tonight is Save the Best for Last. Save the Best for Last. Because isn't that true with fireworks? Isn't that sometimes true when you go to a buffet? You go up there and you go to the thing you love most first to make sure you got room on your plate and make sure that guy down there doesn't come and get the shrimp out of that thing. Bonanza, that was always horrible. People would rush to that thing to get that, the shrimp out of that vegetable thing. I would like, get the shrimp and he'd be coming and be like, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> so we go and get the, the thing we love oftentimes first, but then we leave it to the last. Oh, it's just like I'm enjoying all this stuff, but look at what's sitting right there. Or dessert, huh? Best for last, best for last. Yeah, that's kind of some things that we can identify with. But we're going to continue to go on because we're going to realize that Jesus Christ himself is into saving the best for last. So we're going to go to John 2, starting at verse 1 through 11. I'll have to wait for Raymond because he's really slow. Oh, there he is. <laughs> John 2, 1 through 11. This is when Jesus turns water into wine. And so we've heard this uh, sermon many times. We realize it's, it's a, you know, a fantastic miracle. But I think there's more to it that God has laid on my heart this week uh, that we often don't pay attention to. And so we're going to read through this. Now, I just want to let you know, in those days, weddings were a huge deal. I mean, they are still in the country here, but in those days, it could be a week-long event. And you would invite everyone from the village, and you would make sure you had enough wine for everyone in the village and enough food for everyone in the village. And it was an insult if you didn't go to the wedding. So they had massive weddings. I just saw on, I think it was National Geographic, there's one country for funerals. It costs so much to have funerals, they keep the bodies of their loved ones in their house until they can afford to have the funeral. I think I'd be getting a loan, okay? <laughs> But yeah, because they have lavish funerals. The whole town participates, thousands of dollars and all these different things. And so it was a big deal in those days. Careful planning was needed. You did not want to mess up at these weddings. 
We wanted to make sure that everyone was happy, everything went smoothly. And so we find a situation where things aren't going so smoothly. So I'm going to read uh, 1 through 4, verses 1 through 4. On the third day there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Okay, so we're just going to stop for a second here because there's some argument about Mary. Was she telling Jesus to do a miracle? Was she saying, uh, go ahead and do whatever you do and make some wine? They don't think so. See, they think she was just probably telling them, hey, Jesus, there's, there's no wine. They're, they're running out. As if, uh, you know, we were having this here. Some of you might start to say, not quite sure what to do. The kitchen's running out of rotisserie chicken. Right? There'd be a mass riot and all kinds of stuff. And so they think she was just telling Jesus this, but then when Jesus responds and says, Woman, what, uh, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I think a lot of us begin to understand what Jesus was saying. His hour, his time of ministry had not yet really arrived, had not really begun. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 tells us that everything there is a season, a time for every person, purpose under heaven, I'm sorry, purpose under heaven. Last week we talked about the Lord's perfect timing, right? His timing's not like ours. His is perfect. Remember we talked about that? And how many of you said, I have no problem waiting on God? <laughs> it is so simple. I just sit back and it's like, hey, whenever. No, we're like, come on, come on, come on. Because we run at a different speed. We run at our speed, what we think should happen. But Jesus Christ runs at his speed. So he even told his mother, hey, my hour has not yet come. Yet, he carries out, he carries out a miracle. So let's go to verse 5. Verse 5 says, His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. See, to me, this is the big shazam of the whole story. When Mary's mother said to the servants, Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. She's saying the same to us today. Whatever Jesus is telling us to do, just do it. She knew that Jesus had it figured out. She knew that he could lead. She knew that he would come up with the right response and the right answer. How many of us are looking for answers? How many of us are looking for comfort? How many of us want to understand how we deal with a loss of a loved one? How we understand how we deal with a, you know, a terminal illness? All these different things we struggle with, we just don't know. And she says, just do what Jesus tells you to do. Where do we find such a thing? Wouldn't it be neat if we had a book that had all that stuff in it that we could grab onto? I mean, there must be one in the library in DL. Yes. There probably isn't anymore. They probably ain't come out of there. Probably. It's in the Bible. Yeah. It's in the Bible. Everything that we need for every situation. Now, we've been doing a Bible study downstairs and about becoming disciples. And we have about 23 people that are disciples of Christ if they will follow in what we learned. But one thing that we learned was, well, we learned a lot of different things, but one thing that we learned is that we want to be following Christ, and we want to understand, and we realize that this Bible is full of a lot of pages. And so if I have a problem, let's say, with fear, do I just begin it at the beginning of the Bible and read through and try to find out? No. I find out all the verses that relate to fear, all the stories that end up talking about fear, how to overcome fear, where fear comes from, all these different things, and begin to work on those scriptures so he can work on my spirit, which then works on my soul and then brings me the peace and the victory. See what I mean? So when you study the Bible, when you work on the Bible, if you're really working on a specific problem, find the area of the Bible that speaks to that, absorb all that you can about that, and you can have victory. And the victory comes from the inside out, not the outside in. He gave an example of someone that smoked. And he said, this guy wanted to smoke. He hated smoking. He said, don't worry about smoking. You know, just keep smoking, but find these verses. And if you keep working these verses before long, you're going to say, you know what? I don't want this thing. And that's exactly what happened. But it happens from the inside out, not the outside in. See, let's say I wanted to lose some weight. Let's just, you know, say that. <laughs> it's, it could happen. All right. Played another walrus. So let's say that I want to not have butter anymore. Okay? Now I could say, Sandy, lock up the butter. I don't want butter in the house because I'm not going to have butter. How many of you know that I go Lakes, Lakes Cafe in Perman? Can I have some extra butter, please? Because I'm trying to fix it from the outside in. Fix it from the inside out using the Word of God. 
and you can overcome all these things. How many of you want to overcome stuff? You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. We just got to work the process. We just got to work the process. So she says, do whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, do it. We can close the church down right now tonight because we've got it. Whatever Jesus says, just do it. How many of you think we'd have a better life? But we don't. We struggle with that, don't we? But she says, just do what he says. John 15, 13, and 14 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Whatever I command you. I ask you to do these things. I give them for guidance for you to be a better man or a better woman in Christ, to be a disciple of mine. If I ask you to do these things, just do them. How many of you have kids at home and you say, just do what I ask and it won't be a problem? Now you know how Jesus feels. Why? Why won't they do it? Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it talks about the Great Commission. To go, therefore, and make disciples. In other words, get up out of our seats and go do this thing. I command you to go out there. The harvest field is plenty. Get workers and laborers. I command you to go out and get people to come to know Jesus. But if we're honest, a lot of us, we're not there. Oh, it sounds fantastic. It's neat, but I just don't know about that. I just... Busy, i got lots of things. So over the past 11 weeks, we've been working downstairs, and I believe we have 23 disciples for Christ. Not converts, not saved. Saved and now disciples for Christ if we will follow the process that we learned. That we can go out and help other people come to know the process and understand what it means to be saved, but then transformed into what Christ wants you to be. A lot of us are saved and we love Christ, but we haven't been transformed. We haven't given him the time and the ability and the effort to transform us into what he wants us to be. Butter transforms me into what he wants me to be. And I don't have a problem with that. But when it comes to Christ, the Savior, Christ Jesus, the creator of everything, we say, uh, I don't know. Let me ask you this. Let's say, it's not some, I'm not... Let's say some of you like President Trump. Let's say he calls you and he says, uh, yeah, I'd like to get you on one of my staff, you know, uh, would you be willing to come down to Washington to help me for the next year? How many would do that? All right, let's say your favorite movie star, whoever that might be, or singer, calls you up and says, hey, I could really use you on the road. I tell you what, I got a job for you. Would you come out and hang out with me and help me? Who would do that? So when Jesus Christ says, come on, i got some jobs for you to do. I, I saved you on the cross, and I just want you to go and help other people come to know Christ. How many of you would do that? And some hands went up. I hope those hands are real. Because if the hands I just saw, every one of us helped save one person in this next week or two weeks, there'd be double the people coming to know Jesus Christ. And then double, and then double, and double. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, so here's Mary. We haven't even talked about the wine yet. I tell you what, there's some good stuff that she has, that she said. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. We're called according to his purpose, the Bible says. So think of this. How many of you, let's say, Red, how old are you? Can you hear me, Red? How old are you? Huh? 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Red. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we please, please pray for the lying man. <laughs> Someone yell out your age. 87? 85. 85. Holy cow. Okay, stop. That's just... <laughs> my head. Okay, so for 85 years you've been walking in the earth, but for more than that, Jesus Christ had a plan for you. Before you were even born, he already had a plan set for you and knew what he wanted you to do and how to do it. His plan for us is older than we are. And some of us are pretty dang old. Right? Yes. So think about that. Before we were even born, it was set for us if we will just accept it and receive it. He knew us. He chose us. He gave us to the world so that we could throw ourselves into his appointment. Mm. Eugene Peterson, in a book called Running with the Horses, talked about the struggle of today's churches. Let me read this to you. It was actually Thomas... Uh, Kempis wrote it and he shared it in his book. 
Jesus today has many who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who carry his cross. Many who yearn for comfort, few who long for distress or persecution. Plenty of people he finds to share his banquet, few to share his fast. Everyone desires to take part in his rejoicing, but few are willing to suffer anything for his sake. There are many that follow Jesus as far as the breaking of bread, few as far as drinking the cup of suffering. Many that, never, uh, many that uh, revere miracles, few that follow him in the indignity of the cross. You think that's kind of the struggle today in the churches? We come in here, and how many of you are fired up right now? The, the worship song's got you going, the sermon's got you going, you're like, let's do everything again for Christ. Shut up so we can get out there in the field and do it. <laughs> but then how many, if we're honest, by the time we hit the car, and then we got to make sure there's no traffic, by the time we get to town and we get back home and let the dogs out and make sure the chickens are in and, you know, do the dishes and get the kids ready for this or that and all these different things, it's gone. Because Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so if we allow him into our life, like we talked about with fear and anxieties and all these things, he sucks it out of here. As soon as you hit the parking lot, he begins to turn on his vacuum and steals our joy. And when we lose all that, it's pretty hard to serve Christ anymore. That zeal's gone. We're just, how many of you just say, I mean, I'll talk to someone and say, how are you doing this week? Day by day. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then you say, nice to see you, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story of some swallows. A gentleman was sitting by a lake watching uh, the beautifulness of all the world that God had created, and he noticed two swallows, a mom and dad, and they were swooping down getting insects off the lake. They would fly over to a branch that was about four feet above the water. There was three little baby swallows sitting on that, and they would feed them and feed them and feed them. Eventually, they grow weary of feeding these swallows all that day. And so what happened was mom and dad landed on the branch closest to the shore. And they began to edge them out to the end of the branch. Well, the first one got to the end and he kind of, you know, was fluttering around. But he fell off and he flew. Off he went. Fantastic. The second one, they began to push off, push off push off. And he got to the end of the same thing. He kind of stumbled, went down, but caught himself and flew before he hit the water. The third one's probably like a lot of us, stubborn. They pushed and they pushed and they pushed. He finally got to the end and he spun down and hung on upside down now. He's he does not want to let go of the branch. And so mom and dad began to peck at his talons of his feet until he let go. And guess what? He flew. How many of us are afraid to fly for Christ? We don't want to let go of our comfort zone. Oh, I don't think I could do that. I could never do that. Oh, I hope he never asked me to do that. Oh, I just, I'm just barely surviving my own life, let alone go out and help Christ or help someone come to know him. Interesting stuff about the birds. Let me read it. Uh, there was something that said at the very end. Not until they fly are they living at their best. <clears throat> Same with us. We're born to fly with Christ. Hmm. Verses 6 through 9. We're going to get through this by 9. Okay, here we go. <laughs> you guys are going to run out to serve Christ just to get out of here? No. Verse 6 through 9. We're cruising right along. Now there was there, set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. See, in those days, that to be unclean, they would make sure that they would wash themselves, uh, their hands, before they ate. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it, and when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Jesus Christ saved the best for last. In those days, they would try to get you drunk up on the good stuff, and as soon as you were like there, they would start to back off and give you inferior things. Christ takes the inferior and makes it perfect. He saves the best for last. He does this on so many different things, and we're going to cruise through it rather quickly. If you go to Genesis, and we're not going to go there, but go to Genesis 1 and read about when he created the heavens and the earth. On the first day, he made light. 
On the second day, sky and water. On the third day, land and seas. On the fourth, sun, moon, stars. On the fifth, fish and birds. And on the sixth, animals and man and woman. He made Adam and then Eve. So guys, if we're saying that he makes saves the best to last, gals, <laughs> who was last? Eve. He made all these things and then he made man and woman. And on the seventh day, he rested and said, this is good. I want to tell you that you're all good in God's eyes. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made. Every one of us for his purpose. Oh, you might look over there, gals, I'm sorry, you might look over there at some other gal and say, man, she's beautiful and I'm, I'm just kind of this plain Jane. Christ doesn't see that. The world has told you to see that. Where'd that come from? Except the world has set standards and you're saying, I'm not living up to the world's standards. Don't worry about that. Live up to Christ. We always say that man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. Who are you on the inside? That's where your beauty is. Every one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made for the plan he has for you. Every one of us is completely different in his way. He made each and every one of us separate. You are all special because you're all individual. Keep that in mind. The world wants to jam us all together and say, well, there's some good ones, bad ones. Every one of us was made to be good. We just have to get back there sometimes because of what happened in the garden. Exodus 14. They're, they, they're leaving Egypt. They're at the edge of the Red Sea. And here comes the Pharaoh and all his guys. And they're crying out, oh, we should have go back to Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to die? It would have been better if we just would have stayed in Egypt. They were having quite a fit. Verse 15, the Lord said this. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Get moving. Go forward. Verse 22, it says, so the children of Israel went. We'll go to the walls of Jericho, Joshua 6. When they're going to tear down the walls of Jericho, for six days they march around silently. Could you imagine all these big soldiers, you know, like macho? I can't wait to get out and tear them guys apart. Shut up. Six days. How many of you would walk around a building six days silently trying to tear down a stone wall? I'll tell you what, that takes faith. But on the seventh day, he said, blow the horns and shout. And the walls came tumbling down. What I like about those two stories, saving the best for last, is that they showed their faith to make these things accomplished. It takes faith sometimes, my friend, to step out of the boat. It takes faith to take that very next step. And when you take that very next step, you'll see that he saved the best for last because this short little walk to get there now explodes into something God has for you. But so many of us go, yeah, I'm going to take that. Oh, no, I'm not going to. It's full of blessings. The pool of blessings. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to continue to live my wonderful life. It's just so wonderful. Meanwhile, just over the next step of faith, God has something wonderful for you. So many things take place when somebody takes the next step. I encourage you to do that. Because you save the best for the last. The, the last step that you take in his walk with you to get to that spot is where you see things take place. Of course, God sent His Son, the last and best sacrifice of all, once and for all, the pure Lamb, slain. His blood covers us and covers our sin. He saved the best for last for Jesus, didn't He? And then in Revelation 21, I'm just going to flip over there, 1 through 7, let me read this to you. This is after the thousand year reign and the great white judgment. It says, making all things new. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things that passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Heaven is awesome, but he's saving the best for last. How many of you want to be part of the best for last? Crowd, absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure that when you've got time, give it to God. Give him the first and not the last of what you have. 
Because if you give him the first of you, maybe the first of your finances, if that's what he wants from you, the first of your time, the first from your love, the first from your music talents, whatever it might be, if you give him the first, then he can use it to save the best for last. Sherry and I have been doing this for 10 years. Much different than when you started. Anointed, doing great things for God. Expanding into ministry. But it's a step-by-step -step process. And he's still saving the best for last. We don't know how much more and how wonderful it could be. There's almost 100 people here tonight. How awesome is that? You know what? If we got to get two services, ten services going, fantastic, wouldn't it be? Mm. He saves the best for last. He saves us, and then he transforms us into his disciple to go out and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Bow your hands and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone that sits here tonight. And Lord, I just ask everyone to just stop for a second, close your eyes, and examine yourself. We've just been talking about how Christ saves the best for the last and how people with faith are able to experience those things. And, uh, it, you know, Mary, Mary said, you know, do what my son tells you to do. You know, he's commanded you to do some things. Let's do those things. As you examine your life and you think about the world and time and all the responsibilities you have and all these different things that come upon us. Maybe some of you are finding right now that you can do more. That this idea of coming here to worship because you enjoy it is not true. It's, it's the beginning of serving God. It's the beginning of giving Him praise and glory. Then you go out and do things for Him. So I just want anyone to raise their hand that could say, I could do better. I could do better. Oh, praise the Lord. We all can do better. Heavenly Father, do you see the hands that are up? I ask that you bless them and anoint them. And Lord, you pour out a, an extra blessing, Lord, of power and of courage. The Holy Spirit would speak into their life in the greatest of way. They would find the comfort they need. They would find the security they need, Lord, to go out about your business, Lord. To be disciples for you, to be hungry for you, to make you Lord, true Lord of their lives. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that maybe didn't raise their hands but were afraid to. Lord, the same for them. But some of you may be out here and never have accepted Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've been living the life. You've been coming to church. You, all that, that we talked about, you've been saying, yep, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. But you've never accepted Jesus Christ. Is there anyone tonight that could raise their hand and say, I mean, Jesus Christ, never have accepted him? Amen. Heavenly Father, touch everyone tonight. Lord, you are here in a mighty way tonight. I know that people feel it. And Lord, I ask that you bless them as they go out about the week, that they are changed when they leave here, Lord. This status quo when they walk in is not satisfactory. It's not comfortable anymore. But Lord, they seek to know more of you. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. the moly. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sandy has an announcement. We have decided to change the barn drills from this Friday night, the 30th to July 7th, a week from Friday. So it'll be a week from Friday at 6.30, and if you guys want to come join us, we're going to work on the bears for the Perm Hospital, and it'll be at 6.30, and bring a snack. So next uh, Friday, July 7th. Then also we're talking about late August or early September having a picnic or a get-together to celebrate the church and celebrate the family and celebrate the 10 years. Anyone wants to be baptized then, let me know. We'll do it as a group. We had several last year. Or if you want to get baptized tomorrow, let me know, and we'll figure out a spot to do that. So that's a blessing, too. With that, we're going to sing Happy Trails. And then if you've never been here before, downstairs. <laughs> downstairs over in this area, not the vegetable area, but this other side over here, there's cookies and all kinds of goodies. So there's all kinds of goodies. Go downstairs and say hi to someone. Get to know somebody. That would be great. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, a lot of you are following Pastor Bob Finstrom. He is down at the Mayo Clinic fighting for his life. And uh, I got, he's the one who brought me to this. The first big thing I did in my life was accepting Christ. The second was the day I understood that if you don't read your Bible every day, you will not ever achieve the closeness to Christ that he desires in us. And Bob Finster taught me that, and I love him dearly for that. He writes these, and now he has blessed me with the opportunity to do it. And every month, I have a new one out in the back. 
If you are not reading your Bible every morning, I beg you, start doing it. Whether you use this or you use something else, can I get an amen? amen. All right, and that's all. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're saying happy trails. Happy trails to you. Happy trails, go downstairs, there's all kinds of numbnums.